Let me invite you to stand. I'd like to stand when we read the scripture. Um, we're going to read a long section out of John's Gospel this morning. It's, it's the prayer that John records Jesus prayed when Jesus realized that his life was about to end. And so John chapter 17, we're going to look at the full chapter this morning. Uh, when Jesus had finished saying these things, he looked upward to heaven and he said, Father, the time has come. He knew he was going to die. Glorify your son so that your son may glorify you just as you have given him authority over all humanity so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given to him. Now this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. I glorified you on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me at your side with the glory I had with you before the world was created. I have revealed your name to men you gave me out of the world. They belong to you and you gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they understand that everything you have given me comes from you because I have given them the words you have given me. They accepted them and really understand that I came from you and they believe that you sent me. I'm praying on behalf of them. I'm not praying on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those you have given me because they belong to you. Everything I have belongs to you and everything you have belongs to me and I have been glorified by them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them safe in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one just as we are one. When I was with them, I kept them safe. I watched over them in your name that you have given me. Not one of them was lost except the one destined for destruction, so that the scripture could be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you and am saying these things in the world so that they may experience my joy completed in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, that you keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, so I send them into the world. And I set myself apart on their behalf, so that they too may be truly set apart. I'm not praying only on their behalf, but also on behalf of those who believe in me through their testimony. That they will all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. I pray that they will be in us, so that the world will believe that you sent me. The glory you gave to me I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be completely one, so that the world will know that you sent me, and you have loved them just as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, so that they can see my glory that you gave me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, even if the world does not know you, I know you, and these men know that you have sent me. I have made known your name to them, and I will continue to make it known so that the love you have loved me with may be in them, and I may be in them. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time together. We thank you for this time to be in your presence. And although we are standing, our mind and our heart are bent in submission towards you. So it is, I ask, Father, that you would quiet our mind, that you would still our heart, that the tangible weight of your Holy Spirit would fall upon us and embrace us. Father, that it would be 
your presence in your word that pastor us this morning. So that when we meet people over the course of this week and they say, what did you do this weekend? We'll be delighted to share with them what we did this weekend, but we will testify that Jesus pastored us this weekend. So Lord, use these scriptures, use my words, that they would create open doors for you to pastor us today. We quiet ourselves, we still our minds and hearts before you in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a vulnerability uh, in this prayer that I think in my younger years, and I don't think I know in my younger years, uh, I completely miss. Because the whole thing is, is that when you're in touch with your mortality, you start to realize every journey could be your last journey. And so I know for myself, um, I won't go into graphic detail, but uh, I've been part of a ministry in Ukraine for the last 25 years. The previous church I pastored, we we planted a church in Kiev, uh, in the center, in the center of the city, and uh, I've been making trips there. And about four years ago, I was I was there, and we thought I needed medical attention, and so they took me to a hospital in Kiev, and it's not a place you want to be taken to a hospital. And for no other reason than the emergency ward was up four flights of stairs. And there are these concrete stairs that were built under the former Soviet uh, regime. And so they're all split. You can easily slip through and under a stair. There's rebar poking out of everywhere. And when you're, when you're in the condition I was in, it, it was just hard to be dragged up stairs. And they don't have the same respect for the human body that our medical institutions have here. And I don't think they realize anesthesia uh, has been invented yet. So um, suffice, suffice it to say that when the scalpel was produced um, without any previous injections, it, it, it was a trauma for me, uh, along with the blood and everything else. And since then, I can have anxiety attacks when I travel. Um, I can think that I'm fine, and then I show up somewhere, and, and it's kind of a reliving of that separation. But since that time, the whole thing about it is, is that now before I leave, I realize I have no guarantee of seeing my wife or my four adult children or two grandchildren or friends that are part of our community. I, there's no guarantee that that goodbye could be my final goodbye. And so you find yourself praying for the people God has given you. And so the, this prayer that, that Jesus prays is a prayer of a man who's realizing he's going on a journey. And Jesus is a mystery. He says, you know, he says, destroy this temple in three days it will rise. So he has an awareness of resurrection, but he doesn't know what it's going to look like. There's all kinds of things Jesus doesn't know. He, when people say, is, are you going to restore the kingdom of God now? He goes, I don't know. I don't know. The only person who knows is the Father. No one else knows. In fact, every time someone says God's going to return on this date, it can't be that date anymore. I mean, you know, for all we know, God may have been coming back on that date, but because someone announced it and they can't know, he's got to postpone it to a date that no one knows because it says in the word, no one knows when God's going to return. So, so everything about Jesus is a, is a revealed mystery, a mystery incarnate. And, but, but here he is, he's praying for himself. I know when, when I'm going to travel, I pray for myself. I pray for my wife, I pray for my kids, I pray for my grandkids. It's kind of like a blessing. What are the things that are on my heart for them before you embark on that journey? 
So uh, this prayer resonates. This, this prayer sounds like the prayer of a man who's facing his mortality and is at peace with it, but still has things in his heart that he wants to get off. And there's a lot here, and so don't panic. We're, we're not going to go through everything. When I was pastoring, um, my pastoring was, I rarely spoke topically. It was just expositional messages out of scripture. And so if I said to the congregation, there's probably a month or two's messages in here, there are people who would white knuckle the chair because they'd go, oh man, the pastor could be here. We could, we could spend the rest of our life here. We're not gonna do that. But we are gonna make some observations. And it's particularly, I wanna look at two gifts given, one present shared, and then one prayer that was prayed. Okay, so we're going to look at that. Two gifts given. Is that what it, I called it? Oh, two gifts received, one present given, one prayer prayed. This is the helpful thing when you give slides out in advance. Okay, you, you get to relearn your message. So, two gifts received. God gives Jesus two gifts. The first gift is he gives Jesus the world. When, when it says that all authority has been given to him, that's, that's saying God, God the Father has given Jesus the world. In fact, it says right there, all authority has been given. Do you know what that Greek word for given means? Doesn't take a rocket scientist. I'm not a rocket scientist. I just know it means given. Same word that's used when you give someone a present. This precious blue jewel that God created, that reflects his majesty, his intentionality, his creativity, his love, his generosity. This blue planet and everything within it and upon it. God gives to Jesus as a gift. This, this planet, its beauty and its brokenness, it's given to Jesus. This, this jewel of creation given to Jesus as a gift. I, I'm fascinated by the testimony of astronauts that go into space and they talk about this experience of seeing the blue planet from outer space. They know the war, the violence, the oppression, the grief, the sadness, the brokenness, the poverty, everything that's going on, but you get above it and you look at it. And it's a spiritual experience and causes many of them to think about a God who creates when they've never thought about it before. And I can't remember if it was Buzz Aldrin or not in the Apollo 11, but he, he talks about getting into space and looking back at the planet and he says he put his thumb out in front of the window and he hid the planet behind his thumb. And he talks about what a surreal, mind-blowing experience it was to hide planet Earth behind his thumb. And he found himself thinking, who can hide the planet find the thumb. Unless it's a hand that made the planet. And so this blue jewel is given to Jesus as a gift. And the second gift he gives Jesus is the first followers. The 12 you gave me. 
And there's anything better than being given a planet, it's being given the prototype community, the first community of people who are going to be reconciled with the God who created the planet. So the world is given to Jesus as a gift. Does that make John 3.16? More significant, for God so loved the world that he gave Jesus to the world. But in order to give Jesus to the world, they had to give the world to Jesus. And then he gives followers of Jesus to the world. So that means this, listen. It means that before you ever expressed faith in Jesus Christ, you had already been given to him as a gift. Max Lucado in his book on grace years ago makes this playful observation that if God had a refrigerator, your face would be on it. Your picture would be on his refrigerator. So that just triggered my imagination to, to, to imagine a galactic-sized refrigerator the size of a Milky Way who, who she was looking in the middle of, which means she was opening his refrigerator door. But this galactic-sized refrigerator that has the faces of every woman, man, and child on it. Whether or not they've come to faith yet, yeah. their picture is already on his refrigerator because God so loved the world that he gave his son. And in order to give his son, he gave his most trusted gift that he could ever give anyone. And he gave that gift to Jesus. All authority for the blue planet has been given to Jesus. And out of that, God gave him the first 12 as a gift. Can you think about what that means? What does that mean about God's love? John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that all believe in him might not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 17. What's John? We know 16. We forget 17. He came not to judge the world, but to save it. Because the best gift God could ever think to give to Jesus was the world. So those are the two gifts received, the world and first followers. Then the one present given is us. As you gave them to me, so I give them, or so I send them into the world. Isn't that amazing? As you have sent me, so I've sent them. The second present given is us. We're given to the world as gifts. Imagine that. We're intended to be gifts. Just as Jesus was intended to be a gift, we're intended to be a gift, which means that we're not there to be known for our hostility, our judgmentalism, our indifference, our apathy, what sides we're on. We're intended to be received as a gift. And therefore, the prayer that you need to pray, and it's simple, start your day, remind yourself, is simply this. Lord, let me be today the gift you intend me to be. Amen. Do you realize how different our encounters, our perceptions would be if we realized 
the most important thing that someone can know about my life is, is that it was intended to be an expression of God's love for you. God's care, God's concern. Because we're a gift given to a planet he loves. And so Lord, let me be today the gift you intend me to be. If that becomes our frame of mind, then that changes everything. That, now some of you, you're intended to be God's gift and in the capacity that he's given you that, that gift, you even get a uniform from him. So if you're a first responder, if you're a police officer in the military, for God love these groups of women and men that he gave you. And he even gives you a little uniform to be you and be a gift. Let me be today the gift you intend me to be. Now I was raised Jewish, and so uh, the pictures and the battles and the miracles of the, you call it Old Testament, I call it First Testament, uh, was, 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 and I used to think as a kid, you know, oh, I wish I could have been there when Moses parted the Red Sea or when David you know, slew Goliath. And, and you think about that, I, I tell you now, I don't have to be at any of those. I don't have to see the empty tomb. I don't have to be at the cross. I don't have to be at the Red Sea. I don't have to be there in creation, although that'd be really cool to see how it all came together. Things. I'll tell you where I would want to go. If you could say, Slomka, where in the Bible, if you could go through a time tunnel and, and show up somewhere, where would you want to be? I'll tell you where I want to be. I would want to be at that dinner where Jesus was meeting with the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the sinners. And I want to know, how did he not empty the house by showing up? Because I know when I'm on the airplane or around people that don't go to church and say, well, you know, classic question, in America, what do you do? Like, that defines who you are and what you have to offer. What do you do? And so, what do you do? And I say, I'm a pastor. That's like, if they're not Christian or anything, that's a conversation killer. It's like, you're at somebody's house for a party. What do you do? And you say, I'm a pastor. And it's like, oh, I think I see somebody. I mean, so, so I want to know, how did Jesus go to a dinner with prostitutes and tax collectors and cast off and all they wish is that he stayed around longer. How does that happen? We're so paranoid about getting defiled. Listen, when God, when the word became flesh and dwelt among us, if there was the capacity or the possibility of being defiled, it would have happened the day Jesus was born. But Jesus says it's not what goes into a person that defiles them is what comes out of a person. So we don't have a capacity to be defiled by the world around us. We only have the capacity to be defiled by what we allow in us and more importantly, what we express out of us. So our words can defile a woman or a man. Our thoughts, our behavior, our actions, it's not who we're around, and it's not the conversation that's being held. It's what's in us. So how is it that Jesus has this dinner? People want to be around him. What does he say? How does he sit? How does he engage? Does he lean forward? Does he sit back? Does his arms cross? Does he have a look on his face that tells everybody, I don't approve of you? I mean, what's, what's going on there? All I know is in that moment, he was modeling for us, let me be the gift you intend 
for me to be. Amen. And the whole thing is that that gift isn't withdrawn just because people disagree with you. Just because people don't think like you, dress like you, act like you think people ought to act, use language that you wish they wouldn't use, or have thoughts or actions, percent, whatever. That doesn't make any difference. I mean, it sounds so trite to say that gift keeps giving no matter what the response is. Jesus never expected someone to act like a believer if they didn't believe. Growing up Jewish, we, we were never raised to be judgmental of people who ate pork and shrimp. Now, keeping kosher men couldn't eat pork or shrimp, ham. You never see a Jewish person going around going, those Gentiles. They don't have a prayer until they stop eating pork, shrimp, and ham. Yeah. You say bacon. Yes. Our people would just move through society, be ourselves, be who you are. But with the goal of leaving the planet a little nicer, a little better than you found it. People of God in Christ. Our mandate is so much larger, grander, beautiful than that. Not just to leave the planet a little nicer than how we found it, it's to transform lives in the name of Jesus Christ and to prepare them for that ever, live everlasting life, which eternal life, it's not going to be floating in the clouds playing hearts with little wings on our back. Right. It's a forever life without diminishing resources. That's not good. Without scarcity. Without conflict and war. We, we talk about times of peace because we know that there are times, lapses in the history of human violence when there's peace. In that forever life, we won't, whatever creatures look like in forever life, war is not going to be in the vocabulary anymore. Conflict, poverty, death, disease, destruction, brokenness. Whatever that forever life is like, scarcity. Those aren't going to be words in our vocabulary. And God's given a people as a gift to a world he loves to start to act and care for people in a way that's in alignment with that forever life, whether they respond or not. You know what? People will be attracted to that community. I was sharing yesterday that when I get on a plane, I envision myself, because I'm basically an introvert, that I get my airplane seat, and I imagine this cone of silence descending around me, especially when I put on my headphones, and I'd just be content not to have a conversation, but I, I realize God's convicted me that that's not my right. And so now I realize I have to have a conversation, and once the conversation peters out, then I'm free to put on the headphones. So the briefer that conversation can be, the better when you interview. But what happens, especially if you sit next to a man, is what do you do, right? We're back to that again. And I realize that if I said I'm a pastor, if they're not a believer, then it's like, oh, you know. And that bugs me because then pride kicks in to think like, you think I'm stupid. You think I'm irrelevant. You think there, there's no use for us in the world. So now I answer that question, what do you do with, I work for a mic, I work for an international enterprise. Yeah. We're represented on every continent of the planet. We build hospitals, we care for the sick, the poor, we rescue orphans, women in distress. And I just start going through my list 
And after a while, their eyes are all big like that. And, and then they say, well, who do you work for? And I say, I pastor a church. And it's like, they've never heard it framed that way because we're part of a community. We're a movement. People are attracted to movements, right? But the best thing about it is I can frame it that we're a gift. God intends us to be a gift. Amen. And we're the gift given. Finally, prayer prayed. This is the second Lord's Prayer. You know the first one. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Kingdom come, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day of daily bread. Forgive us our debts. We forgive those who debt us. They're indebted against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's all here in this prayer. Jesus begins, Father. Then he says, glorify your Son. Glorify my name that I might glorify your name. So that you may believe on earth as it is in heaven. I've given them your word. When Jesus tempted, he says, man shall not work, live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. So give us today our daily bread. He says, I finished the work. Forgive our sins. Because that's what the work finished was all about. Forgiveness of sin that would free us to be the gift. And then he prays, protect them from the evil one. Deliver us not, right? Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. He prays for that. So we see all the elements of the prayer that he taught the disciples. So that Lord's Prayer is more of an outline prayer. But we see that outline in this prayer. And within this prayer, we see that Jesus prays for four things. He prays for their in oneness, in me as I am in you. That this unity, this, this unity, we, the word community, communing in unity together. This is the first part, this is the first thing. If, if, if this first prayer isn't answered, then none of the other prayers are going to be answered. And if we want revival, I, I go everywhere, people will say, I'm praying for revival, I'm praying for revival. Don't pray for revival. Pray for unity. Pray for community. Pray for the development of spirit-filled community where people realize that this foundation of our being one together as Jesus is one with the Father and that, in fact, our unity is part of his unity. That, listen, God is not going to pour out his spirit on men and women and youth and kids that have this American individualistic mentality. Why would he? We're just going to give the world more of the same. Why would we, you want to pray for spiritual gifts to be empowered by the Holy Spirit? For what? For what? It was never intended to be given to individuals for individuality's sake. They're gifts to empower the community that's enjoying this mystical union together to be sent out to the world empowered to be the gift that God intends us to be. If our aspiration is not to be the gift given through a foundation of unity, don't even waste your time praying for revival because you'll never see it. Because whatever your vision for revival might be is not the vision that God has presented in black and white throughout the pages of the scriptures, particularly the New Testament, as what revival looks like. It's not there just to pump you up as an individual. To see a few moral changes in society. It's to transform women and men and youth and children to roll back that tidal wave of brokenness so they can receive the gift of Jesus, be the gift of Jesus expressed, and live their life in alignment on earth as the realities are in heaven. 
Jesus prays for their oneness. He prays for their sustenance, protection, their focus, their resolve. It's all here in this prayer. That that gift might be sustained. Jesus prays for their holiness. Now, holiness, that's a tough word because I think most of us have this vision of holiness that you know, is like you have an aura around your head, a halo. You know, holy people are kind of odd but welcome. Um, they, they mix stripes and plaids at the same time. Um, there, there's something different about them, but you can't live without them, but it's hard to live with them uh, because they seem to drain the fun out of life because they're so holy. And, and, and they refrain, they're indifferent, they separate themselves. And that's not what holiness is. If we want a picture of holiness, it's for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus. There's never been anyone more holy than Jesus, and yet everyone wants to be around him. So I don't know what your definition is of holy, but if people don't want to be around you because you're so holy, then your holiness is different than the holiness of Jesus. And so we, we have to think about that. We, I mean, we really have to think about that. That's good. That's good. Because if our definition of holiness drives people away, I don't see it in the book. Because there's never been anyone more holy than Jesus. And lastly, Jesus prays for their effectiveness, our effectiveness. It says that the world may know. We're really meant to know. God gives the world and us as a gift. It must delight Jesus to see women and men, youth and kids being brought alive through faith in him and the world. Not because he's on some cosmic ego trip, but he represents, the, but he understands the healing that redemption and salvation bring. That the world may know. What does he want them to know? And how do we live in a way that lines up with what God wants people to know? This is love. Not that he first loved, not that we first loved him, but that he first loved us. How do we live in a way that tells people, you don't have to be me, you don't have to be like me, you don't have to think like me, you don't have to eat like me, you don't have to sing like me, you don't, I mean, that before you ever make a decision, God loves you. How do we live? In the world we find ourselves in such a manner that everything about us says, God loves you, even though you don't love him. But see, we've got to live that way because before we believe, God had already given the world to Jesus because he loved the world so much. He already gave the world and all of the people to Jesus. How do we live in a manner that's like that? I forgot to share this quote at Pastor Huey's campus, but um, let me read you this quote in closing uh, by C.S. Lewis. This, this quote has always captured my imagination. It's from an essay called The Way to Glory, and it's, he writes this. It may be possible for each to think too much of her or his own potential glory hereafter. But it, it is hardly possible to think too often or too deeply about that of your neighbor. The load or weight or burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid on my back. A load so heavy that only humility can carry it and the backs of the proud will be broken. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest 
and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet if only in a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or other of these destinations. It is in light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with the awe and the circumspect, circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics, because there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, exploit, immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. This does not mean that we are to be perpetually solemn. We must play, but our play must be of that kind and it is in fact the merriest kind which exists between people who have from the outset taken each other seriously. And our charity must be a real and costly love with deep feeling for the sins in spite of which we love the sinner. No mere tolerance or indulgence which parodies love as flippancy parodies merriment. For next to the blessed sacraments, the Lord's Supper itself your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. If she or he is your Christian neighbor, he or she is holy in almost the same way, for in him also Christ, the glorifier and the glorified, is truly neighbor. Lord, let me be gift that you intend for me to be today. Restoration Church, if you build this community together in the way that Jesus has vision for you, and if you as a community pray that prayer, because it's as a community, you go out and you say, let me be the gift today that you intend me to be. You're just a member of that gift that God is giving through this community to Huntsville and beyond. But it will transform how we intersect and how we interact and how we regard people. It will chip away at our judgmentalism, our hostilities, it will remove the triggers from our life that when someone says something or looks a certain way, that trigger gets pressed and we, we become reactive. I remember when our girls were young, my youngest, Danielle, sometimes she'd just fly off the handle and get really upset. And everyone seemed to be fine. i go, Danielle, what's going on? she go, Catherine. She's Catherine's number two. And I go, what do you mean Catherine's sitting over there? Danielle said, she gave me that eye. I go, what do you mean she gave you that eye? And she, she kind of props up her eyebrow. And she goes, you know that thing where she puts up her eyebrow? She looked over at me and she, she lifted her eyebrow at me. I go, you can't let an eyebrow throw you into a fit. But adults do it all the time. <laughs> Jesus' people intending to be the gift that Jesus intends the people to be. We can't be a reactive people. Unless that reaction is one of compassion moved by love by the giver who gave us as a gift to the world. So God bless you as you serve and reach out to this city, as you seek to be the gift that God intends you to be. God bless you.